Welcome back to The Cutting Room Talking Back, where we explore gender diversity within film and television production, and more importantly, how it can be improved. Whilst I'm sure you all know what a director, writer and actor is, we're going to take you through the roles on set that you've probably never heard of. Crews often have dozens, if not hundreds of people responsible for different areas of expertise, many of which go unrecognised when the credits roll. You may have watched the list of names after a film and marvelled at the variety of jobs, gaffers, concept artists, and in the case of numerous Disney animated films, caffeination for the person who brought coffee to the tired animators. These lesser known roles have a pretty big diversity problem, and with such little, little awareness of the kind of work put into these jobs, there is not much happening in the way of getting this diversity gap attended to. We'll discuss that later in this episode, but first, let's test our knowledge with a few of the roles you might see when the credits roll. Welcome to Guess Who. Wait a second. Where's... Georgia? I don't know, Alex. I saw her in the dressing room earlier. Maybe she's still munching on those falafels. Maybe. Oh. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Millionaire Hot Seat, the show where we could just turn your life around with just the click of a button. All it takes is some really calm nerves and a sharp memory of all the random facts you've read or been told and probably thought you'd never use. Well, ladies, gentlemen, and everything in between, that day has now come. Um, it looks at, uh, feels like Georgia, but I think she's on the wrong show. Let's just go with it. So for our first round, we will be playing Fastest Finger First. You guessed it. I will read the questions and the fastest person to press their button wins a thousand dollars! We don't have buttons! Let's just make sounds with our mouths. Okay. <laughs> okay, contestants, are we ready to go? Is that us? I said, who's ready to be a millionaire? Yeah, okay, me, okay, fine. job. <sighs> All right. Roll number one. This role is one that requires formal training and certification. Certification. They are responsible for the safety of cast and crew. Okay. Uh. No buttons? Okay. <laughs> if someone gets hurt, this person is your first point of call. Oh. Um. Beep. Beep. <laughs> safety manager? I need something more than safety manager. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got the right initials. Oh. SM. Mm. Mm. Keep going. Get more. Get more specific. Ah. Uh. <laughs> beep, beep. We've got another beep. Unit safety manager. No, it is the set medic. Okay. Oh, roll obviously. number two. Uh. <laughs> roll number two. This one sounds like that one that you've definitely heard of. Okay. In fact, there are around three different roles of this name. This role is responsible for the wrangling of extras on set. Beep. Beep, we've got a beep. Extra coordinator. No. Ah. <laughs> Depending on the size of the production, there are even more roles which follow this naming scheme. Ah. Typically with a number in the front of the title. Uh, beep. Beep, we've got a beep. F first AD? Go one more down the chain second of title. AD. And second AD. <laughs> yes, well done. This person, this is role number three. This person in this role is going to need to be good with numbers because it's their responsibility to keep track of the dollars. Beep. Beep, we've got a beep. Accountant? Yes. Yay. Production accountant. Well done. <laughs> role number four. This role isn't just essential for film and TV productions, but almost all forms of creative work that are published. This Beep. is another... Publisher? No. Oh. <laughs> this is another role with specialist knowledge and needs both pre- and post-graduate qualifications. Oh. oh, we've got some hands. Have we got a beep? Have we got a beep? No. 
This role is essential for keeping productions out of any form of legal trouble. Beep. Yes, beep. PR. <laughs> Manager, person, HR. No, no, no. Oh. Beep. Yes. Lawyer. Yes, give me more. Production lawyer. Give me another word. <laughs> beep. Yes, Film beep. lawyer. Another word. <laughs> Movie lawyer. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, entertainment lawyer. Thank you very much. We've got... Role number five. This role is one you may have heard of in the news in recent years and not in a good way. Oh no. When something goes wrong with this role, it can go very wrong. Beep. Yes. Intimacy coordinator. No. Beep. Yes. Director. No. <laughs> Their primary concern is the safety of everyone on set. Beep. Yes. Safety manager. I don't think that exists. That has to exist. <laughs> this role may not be needed on all productions. It really depends on the subject matter, but you're most likely needing it on an action film set. Uh, beep? Yes. Stunt coordinator? No. No. But s to do with stunts okay. and things like stunts. Stunt. Think about more the props that you need for beep. stunts. Okay. Beep. Oh, beep. Yes. It's a very weak beep. Wait, no, I take it back. Beep. Stunt prop coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> no. What? Uh, beep. Yes. Prop master. No. The, I need a specific type of prop, guys. Oh, Guns. beep cushion person. <laughs> what are they called? No. A, be a, a specific type of of prop that is needed on action films. Beep. Yes. Guns. Yes, Ooh. who is the person? What, what, what category of things gun are guns? safety coordinator? Beep. Um, weapon. Weapon. Uh, weapon coordinator. Yes, 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 yes. Weapon person. Weapon wrangler. <laughs> well done. I think you've got two points and this. I don't know what has I've got. got. Like three. The last role. This, they, okay. The need for this role will depend on what kind of cameras are being used. They need to know their equipment inside and out. This role helps with the visual quality of the shots. They are responsible for the technical side of cinematography. Anyone? Beep. Yes? Camera assistant? No. <laughs> Come on, Alex. Uh, beep. Yes. Camera technician? You're right with the word technician, but change the word camera. Uh, beep. Technology technician. <laughs> Close enough, it is Digital Imaging Technician. And thank you everyone, thanks for playing contestants. We will be right back after this break for an interview with our special guests, Sophie Durham and Shauna Furlong. So stay tuned because you don't want to miss it. Welcome back to The Cutting Room Talking Back. In today's episode, we've been shining a light on some of the lesser known roles in the film industry. In honour of this, today we have two very special guests joining us all the way from the art department, Shauna Furlong, an art department coordinator, and Sophie Durham, a props master. Without further ado, welcome Shauna and Sophie. Woo! Welcome guys. All the way from the art department. All the way from the art department. <laughs> Down the road. Yeah. We'll get straight into it. So to start, I would love to know what a like average day in your roles consists of. Start with you, Sophie. Uh, well, I can only remember about today. <laughs> um, but generally, as a props master, like my job is to go through and like break down the scripts and uh, just kind of like work out what any action prop is needed to like fulfill a scene, and then you just like collaborate with the director and the designer and get the look of it, and then uh, then you go and find it. And you get in your Jeep and you go. And then you go. Yeah, that's mm. basically it. Is that the fun part? Uh, the fun part is finding the stuff or mm. making the stuff, like the sitting at your computer for hours and hours and hours, like reading things, sending emails. That's the boring part. Mm. But that's like, my job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's fun parts, sure. Mm. What about you, Shauna? Um, yeah, it's a, a lot of sitting at the desk, or if you're me, finding ways to get away from the desk. Um, 
and I guess, yeah, like making sure everyone's got what they need, um, a lot of logistical stuff, hiring trucks, um, getting people in to move all the stuff that these guys, probably not so much props, but dressings. Um, and then there's like very boring, which is accounts. Um, so, you know, chasing people down for like correct invoices. I have a bit of PTSD about that. Mm. I'm not going to bang on about it, but I might. Um, <laughs> and then like PC, and so you're making sure everyone's cashed up and um, getting that turned around. And then <clears throat> I like to think of my job as the barrier or the lioness sort of protecting the art department from the yuck, which is invoicing. You look after a soul. Okay, so like, I'm a mama bear, but I'm not a maternal. No, but you just make sure we're not getting like screwed over by other people. But yeah. <laughs> I throw punches and when required, <laughs> yeah. That yeah. sounds like the fun part. That's definitely the fun part. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's good. I like it for none of the reasons of what I, like the actual tasks. It's everything around that and the actual feeling of an art department that I like. Yeah, the people. So, yeah, the people, yeah, the that's pe right. the people. Not the feeling, the people, <laughs> yeah. Love that, very insightful. So, Sophie, you've worked on a large variety of projects in many genres, including horror, period pieces and dramas. Do you have a favourite genre to source and make props for? And what is the difference in working on the productions? I mean, I have favourite genres would be like comedy and drama. But in terms of like making things, uh, like horror is so much fun. Like the Imagine. things you get to make <laughs> for horror are like so good. So like I did this film in New Zealand like maybe four or five years ago and it was like a remake of this 70s film, the Black, like Black Christmas. We made like all these chest rigs, like people getting killed with axes and like, so all these softs and yeah. yeah, you get to play with a lot of cool stuff and yeah. So horror is really fun, but I hate watching it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm. yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Shauna, how did you find yourself in the position of art department coordinator? And was it something you always saw yourself doing? Negative. Um, I fell into film and TV and, um, yeah, I kind of, blah, 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 I was sort of doing some work at Neighbours casually for the many years on and off and a lot of, I had a lot of mates there from the music scene and so it was always fun and then COVID and blah, blah, I kind of lost my job and I just rang them one day and was like, I need a job and, um, like full time. And so I became vehicle co -ord. Um, I'm like, what's a vehicle wrangler? And they're like, oh, you'll be right. You know, you just put things down, you drive around, it's fun. And I'm like, great. Um, so I did that with no idea what I was doing. First time on set, like, I was that person. You know, I made all the errors. It was fun. But I never once was made to pay for the actual slab. <clears throat> that was good. Um, and then our co -ord left and they were like, um, the designer was like, you should co -ord. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> and she was like, oh, you're very good at it, Shauna. Your skill set <laughs> is, good. you know, you'll be, it suits you. You've got a great personality for it. And I was like okay I had no idea what I was saying yes to and um yeah that was pretty wild and then I kind of I don't know yeah fell in love with it and then neighbors got axed and then I had that opportunity then the fork in the road where it was like do you pursue art co or go back and I was uh, a carpenter um or do I go back into that um and I took a job at the clearing and that was the rest is history that was a baptism of fire and I um really just loved it um, and I got to be a carpenter and do all those things all of the things came into play and it was good so it was an easy decision getting distracted aren't I Don't no no you're great Go, was it an easy decision um it was at the time because a few things had happened in my life and I was like oh new let's do new you know yeah. I think it's rare in life when you get that opportunity to just like jump uh, and I was like I'm jumping this is cool I mean you know six weeks into that job and I don't know you worked on that job didn't you and I wasn't the only one that wanted to, you know, step off the Westgate. And, um, but, you know, when you survive something like that, you really, and the camaraderie and that team were brilliant. And you just, at the end of it, like every Friday, maybe every weekday by the end, you're just like, fuck, we're good. You know, have a beer. Grimes, I love you. Well done, everyone. Yeah. And there's, that's pretty cool. It's a job like that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's lovely. Sorry, I'm <laughs> So you both obviously work in the art department on productions. Um, how did you learn your way around the departments and your respective roles? And was there any formal training or courses you did or could have benefited from? Or was learning on the job kind of 
necessary? I studied film and TV mm -hmm. in WA, um, but I went in thinking I was going to be a DOP. And yeah. then by second year, I was like, ah, everything we shoot looks like shit. So um, <laughs> I was the only person who then was like, maybe I'll do design. And so, yeah, I started doing art department. And then I fell in with like the art department in Perth, which is so small. Mm. And um, I got taken under the wing of like Emma Fletcher, who's like this amazing designer and just did Deadlock. Um, she kind of became my guiding force and like she taught me everything. Sick. And uh, yeah, because unless you go to like VCA here, there's not like a huge number of like great design courses in Australia. Like Melbourne's the mm -hmm. place, but yeah, I think learning on the job. So like having people who take you in and show you how to do stuff is so important like I think it's the best way to learn with what we do mm. yeah definitely and everyone's different you get to start one place yeah. and you're like I know what I'm doing and they're like oh no yeah, we yeah. need you to do this and you're like I've never done that but nobody else who done it before that's not the job and like yeah it's the job here and so you know you've kind of got to be flexible enough yeah, to go adaptable. okay yeah this is the job here <clears throat> no no two jobs are ever the same mm. so it's like if you can use something that you've learned on another job you're mm. like <laughs> yeah. Definitely sounds exciting, to say the least. Yeah. Um, on a different note, do you feel that the current Australian film and TV industry has accessible opportunities for people starting out? And what do you think could be improved? Well, well starting out, I don't know. So, some In art department. In art department. Some people, like art directors and designers, are very into the idea of free labour and internships and some productions thrive on it. And it never feels good to me mm. um, because, you know, they're 10 hour days minimum. You know, you're often asked to do really boring or, um, not boring, but you know, difficult things or dirty work or up mm. department. It's the stuff no one else wants to do. Right. Yeah. You know, graphics, cutting, yeah. hundreds of, you know, IDs, like, you know, but the industry relies on that person and people to do that and if you're a gun at that like a hundred percent you're on the next job paid and i was like yes, you know fair. georgia was an intern on the clearing and she's now running on this job we're on and she's brilliant i've given her name to so many people um kate mckenzie is another one she's uh, now like you will go if you can impress in that moment you'll have a job in the next you know yeah. 10 minutes it is a culture though of like you got to do your one free job mm -hmm. and then if you uh yeah, you got to prove yourself and then, mm. yeah, people remember you. Yeah. It is just about getting into the psyche of, of the art department and like people being like, oh yeah, that person. Yeah. And you got to wait for it to be busy. So like right now, so quiet. Yes. So like there's all these really skilled professionals out there who are struggling. Yeah. So depends on the time, like whether mm. it's easy to get in or not. It's like, yeah, depends what's true. happening in the industry. Yeah, totally. So it's like. Yeah, super interesting. Well, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your wisdom, guys. It's been super interesting. Don't go anywhere, though, because after this, we'll be deep diving into inclusivity and lesser known industry roles. Hello and welcome back to The Cutting Room. Today we're focusing on the lesser known roles within media production. Everyone's heard of the directors and the actors, but what about the roles that are often slipped under the radar? We just spoke with Shauna Furlong and Sophie Durham about their experience. Now let's talk about the levels of diversity and inclusion within their professions. As in the rest of the film industry, there is a vital lack of gendered representation in minor production roles in film. It seems that no matter how far down you go, there's an issue with diverse representation. Mm -hmm. As many of these lesser known production roles are more technically focused, the general assumption looms that the men in the industry are more suited and more capable. But history tells us this is certainly not always the case. Colour grader CJ Dobson worked on the Oscar nominated film Tana and stated that it is too often assumed that she was less technical than her male peers. Even an Oscar nomination wasn't enough to challenge this myth. Some people really can't get their heads around women working in technical fields. Too often, women are thought to be more artistic than technically competent. 
Maybe for our viewers at home, we should describe what colour grading is. I'd always thought that it was pretty artistic in itself. Well, when you really think about it, most filmmaking roles are artistic and technical at the same time. The two are often, the two often are attempts to separate the two. But before we get too deep into that, colour grading is essentially the process of adjusting the colour of a film in post-production. This is done to make sure actors aren't washed out or fading into the background and also to make sure the colour scheme of the film suits the tone. There are some roles which require a deeper knowledge of a specific form of technology, colour grading being one of those, but it definitely has an artistic needs as well. Painters have to know a lot about brush strokes and paint, but no one would ever argue that they were doing something exclusively technical. It's because of this distinction that many women are encouraged to pursue other roles within filmmaking. For technical requirements, the typical expectation is that these responsibilities fall to the men. Another example of this is cinematography. A cinematographer is basically a director's right hand in a film shoot. It is the cinematographer's job to assemble the right technology in order to construct the director's vision. A cinematographer must have extensive knowledge of lenses, lights and cameras and be ready to organise the crew. And while this role is highly technical, it is no less artistic than any other. Famous cinematographer John Alton describes this work as painting with light. Historically, these roles haven't been laden with opportunities for gender diverse people. The American Society of Cinematographers didn't invite women to join until 1980, and even earlier than that, magazines in 1916, 1916 absolutely freaked about women cinematographers asking their readers if they'd ever heard of a woman cameraman. Ooh, spooky. Despite there being some improvement, there is still serious underrepresentation for women and other gender diverse people in cinematography. As of 2015, the American Society of Cinematographers counts only 4% of its members were women. What can be done about this major imbalance? How can women and gender diverse people break into more roles within the media industry that are typically dominated by men? Well, for a start, we need to move away from the idea that a person's gender has anything to do with their ability to fulfil a role. Which seems obvious enough when you say it like that. The second thing we have to think about is how information and opportunities are passed on within these areas. In an article on production design, Variety pointed out how successful male directors do not bring their women keys in creative or technical departments up the food chain with them. Instead, the general instinct seems to be to support their same-sex friends. Ina Mayhew, production designer on the Sugar Queen series, described how conversations would generally flow like this. My friend is a production designer. He hasn't done too much, but don't worry about it because we need to give him a break. Sadly, these kind of affordances are rarely paid towards friends of a different gender, and since there are fewer women in these roles to begin with, they can't bring up their friends in the same way. The answer of what is to be done is a complicated one. While sexism still exists, it is almost impossible to find balance and equal opportunity in these male-dominated areas. There are, however, drives which teach women and gender diverse people about lesser known industry responsibilities and organisations, which help break down these barriers and allow gender diverse people to break into new departments. One example is this show right here. Our mission for this season of The Cutting Room has been to educate women and gender diverse people on how to work in different media production roles, creating a safe space to learn and challenge the norms. You are so right, Alex. Change starts with the open and honest conversations and giving underrepresented people the space where they feel safe enough to push boundaries. We are changing the way the river flows one dam at a time. And on that note, shall we move to the weather? Yes, let's. The weather is our last segment of the show where we recommend media created by women and gender diverse people. This week, we are suggesting work by individuals in specialized roles within the industry. I'll go first with Catherine Martin, who is the production and costume designer for many of my favourite films and co-creator and wife of Baz Luhrmann. She holds the record for any Australian in the Oscars categories of Best Costume Design and Production Design, winning four for Moulin Rouge and The Great Gatsby. My personal favourite is her work on The Get Down. True as the night turns black, this ain't no fairy tale. But I won't quit. Can't you see what I could be? With just a little courage, you could really be something. I got courage. Let's take a trip back. Martin sees her role in film as more of a visual translator, in charge of bringing the ephemeral vision to life within a time frame and a budget. 
and having grown up in New South Wales, she feels very close to home for me. I would like to bring up a show that I actually met Shauna on, The Clearing. Currently coming out on Disney+, Plus, The Clearing is the story of a seriously disturbing cult and the aftermath of its fallout. There are many trigger warnings for this show, so do be careful, but if you're wanting to be on the edge of your seat and see some stellar acting, this is the show to watch. And as a Victorian, it is really cool to see our beautiful landscapes on screen, along with the wonderful production design that was coordinated by Shauna Furlong. Amy, you must be initiated. Those kids out there, it's giving me nightmares. Imagine what it's doing to them. Not only You're the last person to see her. The change is coming to us all. I have a bad feeling, Joe. And my recommendation is the work of Aliki Theophilopoulos, an animation artist for beloved cartoons such as Phineas and Ferb, Hercules, and Milan. She's pretty legendary, and her and you're probably more familiar with her work than you may have first expected. By order of the Emperor, one man from every family must serve in the Imperial Army. You shouldn't have to go. Mulan, there are plenty of young men to fight for China. It is an honor to protect my country and my family. So you'll die for honor. I will die doing what's right. But if you... I know my place. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. We've deep dived into the world of specialized roles in the film and television industry and the implications of lesser known roles being assigned to women and gender diverse people. We also spoke with Shauna Farlong and Sophie Durham about their roles in the arts and production departments. Thank you all for watching this episode. We hope you can join us next week for our final episode of The Cutting Room Talking Back. Oh